We are now live on What's on an Elephant and Castle Facebook page. Hello, everybody. I'm Nick from Retribe, and joining us today uh, is going to be Graham Doddridge, uh, the chairman of Silver. And also, he's got a lot of other fingers in pies and stuff that he does. He's a very, very busy, busy man. And I'm so grateful that he could be here um, and join us today for the next 45 minutes and just talk about him and his journey and what he does. Because I know, I know I've known him for a long time. He's a very interesting guy. Graham, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, how are you doing today? Very well, thank you, Nick. Yeah, feeling in uh, in good in a good place. Good. Can you uh, let everyone at the Elephant and Castle know who you are and what you do in a few minutes? Uh, yeah. Uh, so my name's Graham Doddridge. I live in the Cotswolds with my family, wife, three children. Um, I have an older daughter who lives in the south of France. I am a graphic designer by training. I started a company in 1991 called Gyro, which is now uh, a very large B2B, which means business to business marketing agency. Uh, and that's based all around the world, but I, I don't own that anymore. I, I subsequently sold that and started another company in 2006, which is called Silver. And I'm the chairman of Silver. And it's uh, run by a group of very capable people, uh, including uh, Alison Masters, who was a, a friend and customer of mine for 30 years before she came and took Silver onto the next stage of its evolution. Um, outside of work, I'm uh, a keen amateur cyclist, albeit a fair weather cyclist. And I have a few other projects, such as um, a photographic children's charity, um, and I've uh, created a board game called uh, Crunch Time, which is an eco-educational board game. And, uh, and I'm also involved in a plant-based uh, protein company called Body Hero and a sports, sports underwear brand, called, which is just launching called CXP. So I've got, I've got uh, quite a few things going on, uh, as well as gardening and getting out there and enjoying <laughs> life. Yeah, um, Graham, yeah, I've known you for over 20 years now, uh, I think since about 1997 or 98. Um, we've actually been through quite a bit together when I've been reflecting on, on the journey that we've had. And um, I'd like to just express some gratitude, you know, towards you, your, your, your work ethic, um, and also your compassion and your empathy. Um, and we can get into all of the stuff that you do, like Crunch and the Snap Foundation, um, and body hero in a little bit, but I'd like to, I'd like to, uh, your input basically as someone who's been involved in the advertising um, world for you know for quite a while now since since before you even started Gyro. Um, your 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 what's your take now on what's happened in the last year? Plus also you know since Allison came on board with Silver, and I know she brought in just a whole new dynamic uh, of work um, and and. Kind of a work ethos and the how we work what can bring the best out of people but i i learned a lot about business when i when i met you and that world has changed you know that that kind of ugh, drive and and fight and be at your desk at a certain time because otherwise because we're not going to beat our competitors and it was a very competitive state um, and I would like your take on basically the evolution of how you've seen people work, uh, not just in the advertising world, but in, in all of the other kind of facets um, of, of the corporate world and, and also, you know, charity world. And, and, and what is it taking now for, for people to really be able to flourish? So um, I, I would describe myself really as a Thatcher's child. I, 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 um... I didn't achieve an awful lot academically at school. I was much more of a practical guy. Uh, and so I, I, I would say I never really followed the rules of trying to get into the big agency with a, with a big impressive CV. I kind of worked my way around, around the, the side of the building. Uh, and so when uh, I started uh, Gyro with a couple of partners, back in 91, we, we, I think we were on the same page and we, we had to work really hard to uh, compete with the London agencies, but we, we, um, we had a dream, we had a vision of, of how, how it could be. I think it got bigger than any of us imagined it would, um, but we nevertheless started out thinking we could, you know, come at this from, from, a, from a, 
zero position and 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 really uh, creates some some great stuff um and, th and then in the late 90s it took off we were working in the tech space and as you say nick i think i think we had this work hard play hard ethic we started at 8 30 on the nose um so i was sort of first in last out mm. uh and, and sort of leading from the, leading from the front um i think i think uh as you as you as you uh, get a little older, you realize there's there's wisdom that you learn, the experience that you have along the journey tells you there are other ways of, of doing things. Uh, and I think that um, I, I'm, I would say I'm quite good at starting things. I'm less uh, accomplished at sort of finishing things. So um, getting people to come and join me who are really good at um, good corporate governance and creating uh, better programs of sustainability, um, a better a approach to HR and people management than, than I ever, ever could be, I think is, is the key to uh, silver success. So Alison, who um, was uh, a customer back in the gyro days, um, was the Amir marketing lead at Oracle. Uh, and then she moved to Microsoft for 10 years. And, and she, she has brought some big corporate approaches into silver. Now, I would say uh, if I if I would, if I'd landed on planet Earth today and looked at what Alison has achieved over the last three years, I'd say well before the pandemic, she she'd sort of predicted a pandemic because wow. she implemented Microsoft Teams, which went live a couple of months before the pandemic. She had a, a much more um, progressive approach to flexible working. Uh, which which made me feel slightly sort of uh, Tyrannosaurus Rexy, you know, um, mm -hmm. and and so so a, a flexible approach to working, uh, enabling people to work by giving them the empowerment and trust to to do their 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 jobs properly. Um, Alison immediately bought in a traffic manager called Heather. She bought in an HR manager called Petra. And, and those two missing ingredients helped fluidity of the workflow around the, the company. And then of course the pandemic hit. So nobody could go to this grandiose office that we'd built. We were very pleased with it. It had a whiskey bar and uh, you know artisan lighting and concrete floors that were airbrushed with logos and so on and so forth. And, floor to ceiling glass window is all very fantastic and um and very fortunately i put a five-year break clause in that came to pass in the middle of the pandemic so we were able to extricate ourselves from that so the pandemic has um in, in forced everybody to go away and work from home uh and and so we had the new challenge of wellness mental wellness uh, where we could physical wellness with pilates classes uh, training programs online through Zoom and so on and so forth. Uh, Friday night wrap-ups have become very important with a company-wide quiz and occasional entertainment and so on. So, so you know, just good timing, I think, bringing Alison in um, and Alison bringing in this much smarter mentality and approach to work. And I've learned an awful lot from from Alison, but also from all of my colleagues. You know, I, I had a, a very lovely email this morning. I, I'd recommended a, 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 a junior colleague of mine, uh, Zander, who just uh, asked me if I could recommend a book to him. And I recommended he read The Great Gatsby. And he, he sent me a lovely review on, uh, on the email this morning, which uh, was quite touching. So, you know, you can learn from, from everybody. I, I, I like the way you said that you're really good at starting stuff um, and that you need to put a team around you basically to, to implement it because I find myself kind of, you know, really good with ideas, coming up with an idea for a widget, let's say. Um, and then there's all the structure of running a business. And I'd like to know your advice that you would give people who might be thinking about starting a business in today's age where they're really good at making widgets. But then there's all of the little bits and pieces that come together with the growth and the scaling and be going from a, a startup to actually income, paying taxes, doing all of the things that we f I find myself in right now with Retribe as we grow. Um, it takes a lot away from making the widget, you know, and really where people are just, I'm really good at making widgets, but how do I manage all of this other stuff? And, I, and yeah, do you have advice maybe for people who, you know, struggle with that kind of thing where it takes them away from their creativity? 
Well, I think it's about balance. Uh, at the end of the day, I, I didn't, I don't, I don't think I started off as the world's greatest graphic designer, and I'm most certainly not the world's greatest graphic designer today. But I, I was, I was an ideas guy, um, e even if I couldn't project those ideas in, in what I would consider to be back then the most beautiful. Uh, design aesthetic I kind of listened to customers and I knew I, I, I cottoned on very quickly about the fact that customers had stories to tell and 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 things to say but they perhaps weren't very good at saying them so so my uh my business learnings were really from customers who had to who were failing to answer the very question you just asked which is they're really good at widgets, technology companies that are really good at making computers and circuit boards and sound cards and security devices, but perhaps aren't so good at telling the story of why you should buy these products. So, so that was that was my my that, that was the business I was engaged in. Um, but but as you say, I I I suppose I was a bit like a um, uh, a, a, French, a French child learning about wine. It was it was infused all around me. So you can't, you can't grow up in France without knowing all about the intricacies of wine and the wine regions and so on and so forth. Because going back to the late eighties, I left art school in eighty five. I, I just couldn't get a job in a, in a big agency. Oh my goodness, I wanted a job in a big agency to compete with all of my friends, but I, I couldn't do that. So I ended up walking the streets of Covent Garden and I knocked on a door and I found a very nice chap called John Walsh who gave me uh, a job um, for I think 100 pounds, 100 pounds a week, 400 quid a month. It was, you know, things were pretty lean, but it paid the rent. I had a good time. Um, but in that period, um, I started going to client meetings on his behalf. And uh, so I sort of as a 21, as a 20 year old found myself working in an environment where I was being required to have client liaison um, and so really thrown in at the deep end. About a year or two later, I started my first agency, which I called Dumbleton Design after the village I grew up in. And I went to, um, I guess, uh, one of the bookshops and bought a uh, Lloyd's Bank Guide to Small Business, which I'm sure I've still got somewhere in the study. And, and I just read it from cover to cover. And I read about VAT and I didn't understand whether I should be a sole trader or a limited company and all of these questions. But of course, the answers are all out there. Um, you've just got to go and ask the right questions and find out what they are. Now, starting off the agency, I, I think I turned over about £15,000 in the first year, this being 1987. And, um, and I didn't set aside anything for tax. So uh, first, first, uh, first bit of advice to anybody is uh, uh, tax is, uh, is, uh, is an area you should be very cognitive of, um, both VA, if you're going to go over VAT thresholds and so on. And, 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 and you live in any way, you should pay your tax. I'm a strong believer in that, uh, in the fullness, uh, in, in its fullness, because that helps society to be fair and equitable for everybody. So, you know, I, I believe that it's incumbent upon people to, to play a fair game on that regard. Um, but I, of course, in that first year, I was so excited about earning more money than I'd ever dreamed of that I didn't set any aside for tax. And and um, and I ended up paying that off over the next year or two. Um, and that was a painful lesson. Um, and, and so I think organization of, of the micro and the detail is really key. Don't, uh, don't, don't hide what you don't like doing. Tackle the things you don't like doing first. Um, a colleague of my, mine, Andy Birch, who runs Body Hero, uh, plant-based, high-protein plant-based products, he gave myself and my colleagues a book, um, which I, if I remember correctly, is called Eat, Eat the Frog, um, which isn't entirely aligned with plant-based uh, <laughs> products, ironically. But but what it really says is do the hard do the hard stuff first, and then you'll enjoy the the, the stuff you like doing because you've got the hard stuff out of the way. It, you know, it's a bit like going to the kitchen and doing washing up uh, that someone else has left for you before starting to cook. Don't start preparing your meal amongst all the old dishes from last night. It's just that kind of organization, get clear space, get clear headspace, and then be very, uh, I suppose, very pragmatic and practical about your approach to business, yeah. And I suppose this, um, you know, the, the thing that I've learned is um, sometimes I want things now. 
um, I want to have this now. I want to have this client now. I want to have these systems all placed in now. But what I have I've learned and I'm starting to learn um, more is that things do take time. And when I do rush things, they tend to kind of go askew a little bit. But if I set back and kind of, as I was telling you, the last couple of months for me have been one of these places where I've had to sit back because my body was telling me to just to, to sit back and to sit through this, these kind of little struggles that I've had to have because ultimately things do end up working out okay as long as I keep showing up. So I suppose that's it, right? Is just sit, sit through stuff, keep showing up and, and things will develop if you're putting in the effort. Yeah, I'd, I'd say so. I think there are, there's quite a, uh, a few points you made there, Nick. And the first point is um, that, that, that uh, sorry, I've, I've lost my train of thought, but, but I, th <laughs> I think you've got to, you know, you've got to have a, you've got to have a work ethic. I, oh, I, I, yes. Um, the first thing you said was about uh, wanting stuff before you've earned it. And we live in a world where you can, you can, you know, I, I see it all the time. Small business goes out and buys the flashiest BMW uh, company car before they've um, worked out whether that's coming out of the profit because you can borrow stuff and we're being sold to all the time, you know, buy this car, buy these products, buy it on the never, never. Uh, and that's something to really avoid. I think, you know, I was always taught to, to not, not ever borrow, to, to always, um, to always earn the money before you spend it. In fact, we had a very salutary lesson from um, our very first bank manager called, uh, Jean Brad Bradbury, I think she was called Jean Bradbury. Um, so uh, back in '91, we put together a really detailed business plan. We thought it was a work of art, absolutely fantastic. You know, 30 pages of pure gold. How we were going to change the world, and we wanted to borrow 10,000 pounds. And we wanted ten thousand pounds because really, what we wanted to make it easy for ourselves, right? Let's have some cash in the bank. We could go and buy some company cars or put a deposit down on something, uh, and, and we'd 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 be flush with cash to do the things we wanted to do to make ourselves look big. When you're small, carry flags and all that. Anyway, Jean said, um, "The worst thing I could do for you is give you ten thousand pounds right now." Having read our business plan, and we were like, "What?" Really? Uh, but it's a work of art. She said it's compelling reading, but I don't believe you need the money. I think you should go and earn the money and you'll feel a lot better for it. And more than that, if I if you put £10,000 in my bank, um, I'll take you out for some for dinner. So we were like, oh, OK. That, mm. She said, but it can't, you can't borrow £10,000 from another bank and put it in my bank in order to get you know, free burgers and chips. So, so it's got to be there for a couple of months. So, you know, that was, so we went and did exactly that. And about two months later, she took us for burgers at Tootsie's on the, um, the new Kings road. And that, I'll never forget that. That was a, a, an amazing lesson she taught us. One that I haven't always applied since. And so it, it's, it, it's really easy, easy to fall into the trap of unlearning some really yeah. commonsensical stuff that you've learned in, in the past. Um, there's no guarantee that because you learned the lesson once, you're going to retain it for the rest of your life. So, you know, people do sometimes say things and you have to take that with a pinch of salt. But, you know, that that was powerful stuff. So I, I think work hard, know your value and earn some money before you spend it, you know, on, on, in all in all regards, because debt is a huge stress. Um, uh, you know, and, and one thing that we always in all the businesses I'm involved with, I, I, I take some pride in is paying a supply chain on time. And we there was times there were times in the 90s and the early noughties when when we didn't do that, when we were in a bit of a pickle and we were running fast. And, um, you know, we had we had not not brilliant cash flow, big overdrafts, that sort of thing. Um, and, and 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 subsequently in the evolution of silver right from the get go, we took the approach that we would always pay our suppliers in a very timely fashion, um, and, and because I think that's that's morally the correct thing to do. Um, there's a couple of things that I want to just bring up before we kind of go into other things. Is this of um, the idea of becoming people focused? So yeah. with the businesses, like not only looking after the people who you work with, but also your clients. Um, how that how you've noticed that with regards to the evolution of silver but also what you bring into body hero and your other um involvements and then after that let's talk about burnout so 
go becoming people focused was it allison really that 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 kind of changed your perspective on that um and then how is it kind of how does it affect you today and then we'll go into burnout well i think i've always been people focused i i, I see myself as a people person i started off um working with a chap called roy pratt mbe in a children's charity when i was 11 i was a watch leader for hackney adventure holiday project out of which a motorcycle display team called the imps was formed so my after a year of training leadership training my job was to um it, 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 during my summer holidays, I went to a country house called Sherborne House, and then I went to um, uh, Rankham College. We took over the college, and we did adventure holidays for children from Hackney, uh, Newham, Borough Council, Walthamstow. And so I, um, I really enjoyed. Uh, I, I came away from that experience at the age of seventeen, having done five years, four or five years of it feeling that it was so much nicer to help people and to be helped in many ways. So I, I, I've always in business really put people first. I really value people, friends, family. What I, what I, 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 what I know to be true of myself is, is that um, I can be bullish. I can be, passionate and that can translate as bullish i can i have the propensity to push people around a little bit as well you know i'm just being totally honest with you here and, yeah. that, and not intentionally just with enthusiasm trying to get things done and moved along and i think as business grows and that's all very well to get the to get the lorry off the mark to get the the business over its first hurdle you know just roll your sleeves up, get stuck in, and then sort of demand that from everybody else to help you get where you're going. But what, what, when, when businesses mature a little bit, that, that you need good process. And, and, and one thing that I'm really pretty awful at, I think historically, is I understand good process. I know the value of good process. I love good process, but I'm really not very good at good process. Um, uh, applying the discipline to myself because I'm always wanting to create something new and to challenge and to change and to poke and to prod and to, and so I've worked with a lot of brilliant people over the years, some of whom my own ego and lack of process has pushed away, pushed out the door. They've gone on somewhere else. Um, but the, the moments when process has been, a, been allowed to work around me because people uh, like Matt and Alison and Je Jeremy and Susie and Kaz at Silver, when they've they've come in and said, oh, no, there's a better way of doing this, there's process and Petra with HR and so on and so forth. You know, that that's when the magic really has happened because everybody else in the world wants to know they they don't they don't work well with big egos and showy offy managing director. They want they they've got their own egos, they've got their own desires to fulfill they've got their own ambitions to to deliver upon and 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 so that's where process helps to give room for everybody else and i think that's really important to acknowledge that fact mm. lovely it's um it is yeah it's true we need to have some kind of or some kind of processes to know that these tasks need to be accomplished within a certain amount of time but we certainly don't need somebody sitting over top of us saying this right. needs to be done here. This needs to be done here. Um, and then what, what, um, what we've noticed a lot, Graham, over the last um, year, uh, uh, people working from, from home, especially with one of our biggest clients, is that burnout has been uh, at the top of the agenda because people have had a hard time balancing work and life because all of a sudden work is in your home. You know, you, you could be doing like Zoom calls um, by the, at the foot of your bed and then literally going to bed. Um, and it's very hard to separate the two. So it's, it's this, this idea, you know, the notion of burnout has been really prevalent over the last um, year. And I'm just wondering if you've noticed it. And again, advice for people who are starting up when we say that work ethic is so hard, how do we, how do we have balance between creating our, our widgets, creating our processes, but also having some time for self? Well, I, I think, I, I think um, there, there, there are, there are business leaders and leadership teams and there are people who join businesses. There are people in the middle careers and there are interns who are doing their first year. And, and so they're all on different parts of their journey. And, and I think it's really important for the organization 
uh, and everybody in the organization to respect and acknowledge all of the different people in the organization. So, um, you know, I think, I think very often, uh, you know, if, if there's a them and us mentality and interns don't really care for the managers and the managers don't care for the interns so much that in companies, I, 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 there have been moments in my career when that's been the case. It's an awful scenario. I think, I think caring for one another is critically important. So if you're the leader of a business and you care for everybody in that organization, or you're an intern in a business and you care for everybody in that organization, then care and basic humanity is the key to, to, to preventing that burnout. Aside from that, you have personal responsibility to yourself, you know, which is to uh, sleep well, go to bed a bit earlier maybe, um, get up and seize the day, D do some exercise, you know, go for a walk. It don't, you don't have to run marathons or be an Iron Man or go to the gym five days a week. I mean, if you want to, by all means, you know, cold water swimming, I've seen everybody doing all sorts of things and not all of it's for me. But I think you do have a personal responsibility to, to, to keep well um, and, and physically well, eat well, mental wellness are, are massive issues. I, you know, I, I, I've seen mental illness um, at first hand throughout my life. I, I know we all have. Uh, we all know somebody, a family member who's struggled with alcoholism, struggled with work, life balance. Um, so I've seen the best of it and I've seen the worst of it. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, I, I, I uh, you know, I recognize that it is a challenge for everybody. Um, I, th I think, you know, I've seen fine examples of caring. Um, are, and uh, my colleague Alison, I've referenced lots, uh, my colleague Andy as well, that they are caring people who really look out for the people around them, I believe. And uh, I think that's um, been evidenced by, uh, by uh, the, a positive uh, welfare environment um, by and large, you know, um, it's, it's a challenge for companies to to help people who might be on the end of a Zoom call, who might not have the physical, who might um, have lacked physical contact. If you know, particularly a young a young intern who who historically might have expected to be working in a in a sort of hot house of creativity with a, a, a quick dram at the whiskey bar at the end of the day and a slap on the back is now sort of wrapping up and and and, and then looking as you say around the four walls of their flat very very challenging um and and as a company i think the, the program the wellness program and the wellness kits that have been sent out by 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 the leadership team has really paid dividends also listening you know we We've done surveys about uh, about how people are coping and, and whether they want to actually come back or not. And so that's that's and the next challenge that business is going to be facing is whether how they manage people coming back to the workplace, if, if indeed they are, whether it's a blended hybrid solution, whether it carries on being remote working. Um, I, th I think there are, it's important to think, recognize there are lots of pros as well as cons of, from working from home. You know, you can... You can walk the dog, you can have lunch with your family, if you know, unless you're in a flat on your own or, or your friends or what have you. you. You you know, people are adapting and changes. I, I have a real belief that humans can adapt to their environment uh, very, very extraordinarily well. And um, so we've seen some real successes as well as, uh, as well as, you know, one or two other people who may have struggled. So, yeah. I think that, um, you know, you do mention that you've seen people who've struggled and, uh, and so have I, and I've struggled myself. And I think that the one thing that is, it's, it's a huge hurdle for people who are struggling is they might be at a, at a workplace or in an environment where letting a leader, letting part of their management team know that they are struggling is still a stigma. Um, you know, it was for me because I was always taught that I could, uh, you know, a real man stuff, you know, I can sort out my own problems and I can't cry and, you know, I can't reach out for help. Um, you know, these, these stigmas were, were really embedded on me from the time I was a child. And it was really, you know, at 45 years old, when I was super crushed, that, you know, help me came out of my mouth. And what I really would like to people to, you know, what I endeavor to do is to get people in the stages where I can recognize that this is something that's uncomfortable. This is something where fear, fear or trauma responses are coming in. And, um, you know, our corporations now becoming more mindful, not just of, not just of like, you know, being 
uh, aware of mental well-being uh, and physical well-being and and the kind of the whole gamut but actually being able to recognize and give space for people who might be struggling a safe and uh, outlet to say hey I'm struggling today um, because it's probably the biggest hurdle that that I've seen people come up with is is just you know we're doing all of this stuff for people but people still can't get over that hurdle of saying yo boss you know what um, something's happened and I just can't show up today because I'm really struggling um, yeah do, do you do you see that that becoming something that that we're dealing with or do you think it's still a struggle that people have um, I well to, to, to be entirely honest I'm I'm less involved in the day-to-day -day business of the business than I historically ever was and so in, in that regard I can't in all honesty answer the question in a in a meaningful tangible way that probably is useful other than to say I've observed um, other people doing a great job to help their colleagues I, I couldn't really say from a, my own perspective whether what I've done has or what we have done um, I, I, I think um, just from being socially aware of, uh, of uh, and keeping up with with the news and so on and so forth. Um, you know, we live in very extraordinary times where there's, on the one hand, there's populist uh, leadership uh, in the in this in you know in in America that's been thankfully <laughs> overcome <laughs> with, with Joe Biden, who I, who I believe is doing an incredible job. Well, not Joe Biden, his whole um, his whole leadership team is is a diverse human humanist caring group of people but we we have a, a populist government in this country which I, I i pray to get to the next evolution where we don't have that mm -hmm. but so we we have this we have this extraordinary um time in our lives where i think people in families community small business and large business are are, are frankly uh doing the right thing by the people that they work with and live with and cohabitate with um, even even if the governments that lead lead aren't doing the right things, in my opinion. So so we we live in uh, really interesting times where where I believe people are more polite to one another. Where I believe people care more about. I, I think people have always cared about people, but we have these extraordinary rallies of pro this and anti that and pro this and anti that and anti this and pro that and and, and there's you know it's the division of the fuel of division through the tabloids and the popular medias and so on just really don't don't really help people to uh, come to terms with things so sometimes i think it's really good to just turn that noise off but overall i think i've seen uh, my, my own personal observations are that companies and, and people are um are doing a a you know a much better job of listening to each other and caring about each other um and you've got you've also got the ecology of the planet um and and the you know, the climate crisis that we uh is all around us and is looming large and is becoming much more uh an issue to everybody than maybe some of the daily struggles as well yeah. but the daily struggle takes priority right you've got to put food on the table for the kids you've got to pay you got to pay the, the the rent this this month. So so there are some real issues that people are are facing. So sometimes the climate crisis is like, oh, that have to wait till next week. But of course, it won't wait till next week. So there's another pressure that people are feeling that that maybe they didn't feel 15 years ago. Even if, even though the makings of the climate crisis were 15, 50, 100, 150 years ago. You know, gross gross uh, increases in population, um, uh, farmland being used for production of meat, um, which, you know, 83% of farmland used to produce meat, uh, which only produces 18% of human consumed mm. calories. Those kind of challenges are all about us. And it's, it's down to the human race now to resolve some of these challenges, as well as living your daily life and keeping sane. <laughs> okay, let's get let's let's get into that. We've been talking we've been talking a lot about the corporate world. We've been talking a lot about you know becoming more people, more human towards each other. Let's let's just be kinder to one another. And I think that we can definitely do that in the corporate world. I think it'll make corporations flourish. But let's get into uh, board games and let's get into looking after you know we've 
I know people are going to, to Mars and looking for stuff, um, you know, and, and maybe we will be a colony out there one day, but really, Graham, you know, like in our lifetime and in our, and, you know, children's and children's lifetime, we've got to look after this planet. And, um, and again, like we can look after each other as much as we want, but if we're still treating the planet the way we're treating it, um, we're not going to have, you know, a place to look after each other to do, to do that with. Right. So let's talk about, let's talk about your board game. Um, how did that come around? Okay, well, um, uh, I firstly have to caveat it by saying I'm I'm I, I'm racked with hypocritical guilt because I don't always practice what I preach, and um, that that I think is uh, you know that's one of the things that I am a weak human in regards to in that I I. Um, you know, I, I can't help myself. I consume, I, I ride lots of motorbikes. I, I do stuff that I know is not great for the planet. Um, so I have to caveat what I say about crunch time with, with that um, ab admonition. Uh -huh. Admission. Uh, so so um, the crunch time came about about 10 years ago. I was thinking, I just, I don't know, I was, maybe I was out on the bike or something and I just, uh, and I just sort of, popped into my head. I thought, well, what, what, you know, people play Monopoly, um, which is another capitalist game that's been around for a hundred years. In fact, it's got to be, I don't know if it's for sure, but after chess, it's, you know, the, it's probably the world's most played board game and most known board game. And it's pure, it's based on pure greed and, and beating your neighbors and competitors and, and bankrupting them and destroying them. You know, it's, I mean, it's all the worst of human, uh, the worst human of human attributes in, in embodied in one game. So I was thinking, well, why, why, why hasn't anyone invented the antithesis of that? So, so I invented this uh, game called Crunch Time, um, and uh, essentially, uh, you it's got it's a game of two parts where you firstly destroy the planet, and secondarily, you do good deeds to re re repair the planet. Um, uh, Greta Thunberg went to the uh, World Council recently and was asked what should people what can what can people do to help save the planet and she said be informed and so i think crunch time plays is the is a is a fun way to help educate yourself um you know about turning off taps about having the correct tire pressure in your cars it's you know pennies take make you know look after the pennies and the pounds take care of themselves you've heard that expression before well don't fill the kettle up and boil five cups when you only want one. Uh, put a jumper on and turn the heating down. Don't don't go on a private jet on holiday. Um, you know, start. It's <laughs> ridiculous. Um, that is ridiculous. Get, get, you know, don't 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 go in your yeah. own. You go to, go do a lift chair. Walk more. Get on a push bike. Um, you know, and of course, a very few people don't get on a private jet. <laughs> But <laughs> maybe back in the day, right? Back in the day, don't. No, 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 never, never, <laughs> no. never. You uh, the Concord ones, come on. Maybe, yes, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I, I actually, I want to try crunch time. We'll have to make sure that um, that when we have our uh, some kind of coffee day, that you can introduce me to crunch time because you're right, it is about awareness, and I think that we need to be taking these steps to. You know, for me, it is about recycling. For me, it's about, you know, living uh, here in Soho, um, trying to not eat processed food because it's so easy just to go into, um, you know, a grocery store and grab a, a ready meal for one, and, you know, and stick it in the oven. And then all of a sudden I've got this plastic that I got to bring out the next day and I'm feeling guilty, but it's about convenience. And I think that we have, we do live in a world that's just made, it's just so convenient for one another um, and for ourselves. So uh, I love what, what, what you say about, well, what Greta, Thunberg said about um, becoming more aware and educating ourselves on, on the situation that we're in. Um, and there's also a couple of other projects that you're involved in. The SNAP Foundation, you've told me about that. Um, and, I, and I know you do have a love for photography because I follow you on Instagram and I think you are, you are a very talented man. Um, but tell us about how your, your, your love of photography and, and how you, you turn that into, again, making it a more human-centered um, approach by, by trying to help people. Um, I, 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 as I referenced earlier, I, um, I had worked in a charity, the Imps Start Trust, um, from the age of 11. So my, and I, 
I've been working with them now for the last 20 years again. So overall, I've been working with the IMPS motorcycle display team, which helps kids in high knife crime area of Newham uh, for uh, on and off, but uh, for 45 years. But I wanted to, um, and, and, and I've been doing Delalio cycle slams for the last 11. I built a house in Kenya for Habitat for Humanity. And I was doing all these things. And I just thought, well, I, I like it, but I there's no... Um, I, I wonder if there's a, any charities that would have something that I really like doing that I could really immerse myself in, uh, you know, like photography, for example. And, and as I was thinking this, I got an email from a photographer friend of mine called Remy Whiting. And he said, oh, Graham, would you support me as I'm going to do a photographic project in town, uh, Quide Township uh, near Port Elizabeth in South Africa? And I said, sponsor you i've got a better idea why don't we start our own uh, actual charity and uh, we came up with the name snap as in uh, snapping a, snapping a photo uh, you guys are ahead of me on this one uh, so we came up with the snap snap as the title of our um of our project and, and basically we take uh, photographic students um uh to uh, from all over the world actually we've had students from china and america and the uk um uh, and, and go, gone in going into the townships to teach um uh the children in the townships how to express express themselves through photography um and uh i i would uh, i would cite uh, for example uh, when I when I was there about four or five years ago, and it's been tough because of the pandemic to to get back down there. But I would like to reference and thank uh, United Through Sports who co have hosted us uh, while we've been in in Quide Township um, and hosted our students. They've done a, an absolutely brilliant job in helping us bring Snap to life as well as Remy um, and and all the staff at United um, Through Sports. Um, but I would also like to uh, reference uh, the, the uh, Natasha uh, Clemmy and um, Amy Jane Davis, a couple of the students who are sort of still in touch with vaguely via Facebook, who I interviewed at the time of them working in the projects for um, a, a few months, five years ago, uh, and they they had they got an enormous amount out of helping other people, and their stories, which are on the Snap Foundation website, are. Um, are really uh, empowering and uh, emotively charged, you know, and, and part of it, I, you know, when, when we first went out there, we thought we're helping children express themselves in a way that they could never, they'd never have this opportunity. They've not got shoes on their feet. Um, so the idea of them having a photograph to take a, 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 to capture their moment in their life, to pin up in their, in their home was, was not a possibility. Um, so we managed to get Polaroid to sponsor us and various other people uh, and we went out there, but the stories of the, of the student teachers that came with us and uh, from, you know, they were just really, really made it a very worthwhile experience. And, and that's been a, a source of great pride. And I, I think the constant message through this, you know, little over 40 minutes is about how can we get to a place where we can help other people? I know that's been my journey is, is you know, being so kind of center focused for so long that the second that things changed and I started to think about others before myself, you know, the life changed for me. Um, so I love what you're doing there. And then and just as we're, as we're wrapping up our, our time together, Body Hero, um, which is something that I'm, I'm really super interested in and I want to try it because that's a point where I am in my life. There we are, <laughs> that, you know, this, the, the idea of self-care Okay, get them all put into an envelope and mail them to me. Cool. The idea of, of, of self-care is something that is, is kind of, yeah, I used to work out a lot when I played professional sports. Um, but, you know, in the last, since I've stopped and since I've been, you know, doing other things, I've, I've really have, like food has been a big thing for me where I've not been eating well. I've almost been hibernating, like comfort eating. Um, so I haven't been a hero to my body. And yet I'm 50 years old and I, I, I feel so young. So, you know, the concept of body hero, just the name of it really just attracts me. The fact that why, you know, let's look after these, these meat suits that we have on us for whatever, how long we're along that we're, we're on this planet for. Um, uh, how did it come around? 
Um, I started working uh, with a friend of mine on a, uh, we, we, we were on a road trip. Um, uh, he's a chap called Guy Berriman, who's the bass player in Coldplay. And he and I were on a road trip and we came up with this um, milk drink idea. Uh, it was going to be breakfast in a bottle. Then it became all natural milkshakes. And we ran it for a couple of years. And then we took on a, this, uh, we, we, were, we invited um, a chap called Andy to come and join us. And he was previously the COO of, of um, Virgin Active. And, and he ran a report, uh, uh, um, he, he did a, a research project um, on our behalf with a company called um, v Verve. Um, verb and they and they said you're going down the wrong track you really should be thinking about the future of the planet plant-based is is where you need to be and we kind of thought that actually resonated and made a lot of sense um and then a lovely friend of mine phil brown who i've worked with for many many years came on board so the, between the four of us guy phil myself and andy we created this brand um, which you see here um which is um you know, the two leaves which form a shield. Um, and, and essentially we make shakes, powders, and uh, chocolate bars. And, and these are all plant-based, they're all GM-free. Um, nice. 20 grams of protein in, whether it's a shake or a, or, a, or a chocolate bar, there are 20 grams of protein in everything we do. Um, it's all recyclable packaging. It's made with no refined sugar. It's made with um, golden pea for protein and that we and we've got a real focus on taste so we uh, you know I, I i we did a lot of study of, of products in the market that were similar and they they all tasted pretty awful you know and you kind of think well why would i have to suffer to to eat plant-based and the answer is now you don't because <laughs> these products taste absolutely delicious and all of our reviews um will reaffirm that so we're really proud with the products we've created and it's, it's very early days for us, so you haven't heard of it just yet, probably. And um, and um, hopefully you will, you know, Body Hero's vision is to help you help yourself and to help the planet all at the same time. So um, the one thing I, I just want to say um, um, before we finish up, Nick, is uh, what a great privilege it is to have worked with you over the last 30 years. Um, you, as you say, you do look uh, 10 years younger than you're 50 and a uh, very handsome chap, um, but it's been a real privilege to work with you and to see your evolution through the, the bad times that you've had uh, into the place that you are now is, has been a, a, um, a, a great joy to me and uh, a privilege that we're in touch and, and, and uh, I wish you and retried very well. You're doing an incredible job. It's really important to people. What you're doing is changing lives and uh, there's no greater uh, cause, uh, you know, that I, I believe, truly believe. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Graham. That means uh, an awful lot coming from you. And I, I do love our journey together. And I love the fact that it's, it's, it's not over um, and that there's, there's, there's more paths that we're gonna um, go down together in the future. So. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, is there is there anything that you want to kind of make? I'm I'm interested. Just a quick one. Any ideas? Anything burning up here for the future with Graham? Oh, Do you have anything oh. cooking? Oh God, yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, there's always something. Um, you know, I, I've got. I, I'm working on a. I've got a book. I've got a an album in the. Uh, you know, I've got a novel. I've got an album. Uh, yeah, there's always two or three other projects in the background. I've got an old Follis 98 from 1951, which is a like a Mr. Bean motorcycle, which I've got to rest which I'm, I'm restoring. Um, you know, there's there's always quite a few things going on. So there's always something, um, there's always plenty on the, on the back burner, but yeah. Thanks for joining us, Graham. Thank you, we'll Nick, you thank you so much. See you soon. Okay, thanks everybody at the What's On I Love Castle Facebook page. We'll see you soon. Thanks for joining us.